All right, we're recording. Go ahead. Thank you. Let me get things. Um, seeing a presence of the quorum of of a quorum of community resources committee, uh, I'm calling this meeting of the community resources committee of the town council to order at 4:32 p.m. on May 12th, 2022. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time. Um, at this time, I'm going to make sure that everyone can be heard and we can hear everyone. So I'm going to call the roll. Uh, Pat. Present. Uh, um, Shalini. Present. Mandy is present. Um, Pam? Present. And Jennifer? Present. Thank you. Um, we are all here. We're going to move right into our agenda. Um, although Jane is not here yet, um, but Chris, do you have any update on her? I know she had wanted to attend. Is she in the audience maybe? Not yet. Um, but I, I think we'll still continue with the agenda and just watch out to see if Jane shows up. Um, so we're gonna start with the proposed preservation of historic structures general bylaw. Um, a new version was put in the packet, both a clean and a marked up copy. Thank you, Ben and Chris for that marked up copy. That was very nice. Um, ben or Chris, do you want to um, talk a little bit about the changes before we go into deliberation and making a recommendation to the council on it. Um, I would uh, call on Ben to make these, uh, make the announcement or make the presentation. Um, I'm really here to answer questions. Thank you. Great, thanks Chris and thanks Mandy. Um, yeah, I guess I would just say, let's see, I think the last time we spoke with the CRC about the bylaw was April 14th, I think I have in my calendar. Um, and then on April 20th, so about a week after, uh, I had a historical commission meeting. Um, and we, at that meeting, we kind of further discussed the bylaw. There were some um, concerns that we raised as staff of just about the um, volume of applications that the bylaw could bring about as written, um, both with the age threshold staying at 50 years and with the this like part C of the definition of demolition that would focus on removal of minor or removal of important architectural features. And so we uh, discussed that at the historical commission meeting about kind of other ways to explore, you know, other tools that could be used for preservation um, outside of the preservation bylaw and kind of to kind of simplify the bylaw overall. So we had that conversation on April 20th and then uh, the historical commission um, in you know, trying to kind of expedite the process, understanding we were up against a uh, deadline. It's been referred, uh, basically it formed a subcommittee of, uh, to meet with Chris, Rob and I, and that subcommittee we met twice, um, I think about you know, back to back weeks. And then uh, we're able to come to some sort of uh, resolution kind of a, around um, changes to the bylaw. So the, uh, What's presented to you today, I guess, is that is that version where we've made a few changes um, in response to some concerns that we had, and then agreed to by the historical commission and their and their subcommittee. So, um, I'll just quickly go through um, the kind of higher level changes that were made. There were some kind of just minor inline changes in terms of grammar and stuff like that, but the. Um, Chris, I, I saw your hand up a second ago. Did you want to add anything? If you wouldn't mind, I just would be reluctant to call the two people who came together a subcommittee. Um, they offered to do this and they met twice. And so I wouldn't really um, characterize it as a subcommittee because then we get involved with posting and minutes and all of that. So that's my only caution. Mm, okay. Um, thank you. So the the um, changes that were made, um, the first one was to increase the age threshold from 50 to 75 years. So that's that initial threshold as to whether a building is 
um, subject to the bylaw or not. So at, as of now, the current bylaw is a 50 year threshold. So buildings constructed before 1972 um, are subject to the bylaw and are, if they're proposed for demolition, they're first uh, looked at to, to see whether they're significant or not. And then whether there should be a one year delay placed on their demolition. Um, the new proposal is a 75 year threshold. Um, so that would be uh, doing my quick math, 1948, I think. Um, so that would be the, the initial threshold to, to, you know, if buildings are subject to the bylaw. And obviously, you know, as time goes on, uh, you know, the 75, the target moves up. So in a few years, it'll be in 2025, it'll be buildings built before 1950. Um, so that was the first change. The second change was um, the definition of demolition so what what actual act what action like constitutes demolition right now in the current article 13 the definition is um you know any act of raising or um, modifying or removing a building or portion thereof and it's been this really vague definition like what does a portion thereof actually mean um so a, a really important part of this bylaw was to and welcome jane hi, hi jane um, a really important part of this bylaw was to uh, remove that vagueness and really be very explicit about what is the what constitutes demolition. So, the initial proposal was to have a three-part definition that was, you know, complete and total demolition, so 100% demolition, uh, a more partial demolition, so 25% or more of of any facade was what we settled on. So essentially. You know, if you're going to remove like a, an entire uh, part of a wall or something to add a add an addition, for example, that would constitute demolition. And I would say, for the most part, um, you know, that's that's um, accepted by Mass Historical Commission. There are uh, numerous cities and towns that have that partial demolition um, definition, but uh, the in our proposal. Um, as presented last time, also included this uh, third definition of demolition that included the removal of important architectural features. So that would be, you know, windows, porches, trim, door, uh, chimneys. Uh, so getting even more uh, smaller scale. And so um, we had just, we expressed some concern about how the actual implementation of that uh, town-wide um, and what that would, um, you know, do for our workload and you know how it would actually be implemented and and Jane also um, you spoke with uh, a representative from Mass Historical Commission who you know uh, didn't sounds like she didn't recommend against it but didn't said that not many other communities or no few other communities do that and the bylaw isn't really meant to capture those minor um, feet, removal of minor features. So um, we came to a, an agreement to drop that part C of the definition of demolition, um, you know, understanding that the part A and B will, you know, capture a lot of the projects that, that we want to. So um, those were the two changes that were proposed from the, from the previous version of the bylaw. Thank you, Ben, and welcome, Jane. Thank you for attending to be able to answer any questions we have. Comments, questions from CRC members? Jennifer. Um, yes, well, I did want to ask, what was the what was the ultimate resolution in terms of if the determination was initially going to be sent to a subcommittee, but that was problematic with open meeting law? Ben? Um, yeah, so... The way the bylaw is written now, it adds, um, it, it provides some flexibility. So first of all, it says the commission may delegate authority to, um, or I'll just bring up the text just to make it clear. Um, down here in the administration section. So the commission may delegate authority at a public meeting to make an initial determination of significance to one or more members of the commission or municipal employees. So, you, you're uh, correct that if it's if it's more than one, um, 
commission member, um, then it would be a subcommittee and then subject to open meeting law and hosting the meeting. So the bylaws as it's written now provide some flexibility. So the commission may choose not to delegate this authority. They may choose to retain the, the ability to make the determination of significance. Um, it could just be, um, you know, there's one or more members of the commission or municipal employees. So they could just decide to have it be one um, staff person or one commission member making that determination. Um, or it could be one or more members. And then obviously it would be subject to the open meeting law. But I think um, the language as written provides some flexibility um, in, in, in having these different you know, options. Any follow-ups, Jennifer? Yeah, I do have, um, so I'm just trying to, so the commission could decide to refer it to um, a, a member, a, a town employee without any commission member involved. Correct, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm just trying to wrap. So then you miss kind of the expertise of someone on the commission, but they would have to, come back to the commission and the commission would ultimately vote on it. Um, if the, in this example, if the municipal employee finds it to be significant, then it would go to a public hearing for it to be. But what if they find it not to be? Would that go back with the commission, historical commission members have any, would they be able to weigh in on it again? I mean, they're gonna refer it to a staff to, and then if the staff decides it's not historically significant, Will that go back to the commission so they can? Um, there is a avenue for the staff person to seek input from historical commission members in the same way that like, um, you know, I can email commission members, but have them like respond individually to me. So it's not deliberation necessarily. So the staff person could email commission members for their input. Um, and not be in violation of the open meeting law because they it would just be providing an opinion to the staff person. Okay, so I guess what you're saying, it's not per application. So an application comes in and then that application gets referred to the staff or the staff might decide it's not significant before it ever gets to the commission. Correct, yeah, it's not on a per application basis. So every, you know, I you know say it's every every few months the commission might vote to to uh, to change who they delegate authority to um so yes if 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 the staff person finds it not significant it would not go back to the commission but everything will come to the commission first no nope. so a staff person might see an application decide it's not significant and the commission never correct yeah no. hmm. chris think about that so there's the opportunity for um, whoever the designee is to um, consult with another person. Um, if the designee is a staff person, the um, designee can consult with the chair of the commission, um, as long as that chair isn't designated by the commission as um, part of a subcommittee. And likewise, if, the, uh, if a member of the commission is made to be the designee, that designee can consult with um, staff members. And so um, there is an ability to have more than one um, person or more than one mind um, in the process of determining whether something is significant or not. So I think what's probably going to happen in practicality is that um, if there's any doubt of whether something is significant or not, um, the designee would bring it to um, either the commission member or the staff person and say, you know, what do you think? Um, the other thing is that if it's a commission member, I think they would ordinarily be consulting with staff because a commission member probably isn't going to have a lot of time to do a lot of research and the staff you know, I'm not saying the staff is going to have a lot of time either, but the staff is more likely to spend the time to do that research. Um, so I just wanted to say that, that there's no, that there, it's not going to be one person always making the decision. That person can consult with others 
to make that decision. Jane? I'm sorry about that. I'm looking into the sun and I can't see whether I'm muted or not. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to uh, support what uh, what Chris has said with a slight, a slight twist on it. And that is that um, the flex, Ben referred to the flexibility of this language so that the commission may make a different choice of who is designated um, at any time. Um, so I think, uh, and, oh, there's one other thing. Um, I, some of the discussion is, um, seems like it's getting into procedures a little bit and which is fine, but I think with a bylaw like this, the commission may want to have some, some written procedures that are, that are a beginning place for us. Uh, because this will, this is a different way of operating and we may want to, um, you know, see how it works in the first few months, and then um, and then come to an agreement on how we're going to how we're going to treat treat the applications and the process, the procedural aspects of it. Thank you, Jane. Pam, uh, I'm going to follow up on that a little bit. The way I was reading it was that um, a member of the commission and a member of the staff. So you could have literally one from each um, organization essentially <clears throat> to work on, a, on an application without violating open meeting law. And that, that's how I understood it. That was the flexibility. Um, <clears throat> and maybe somebody could tell me if I'm reading that incorrectly. That would make, that would make somebody more comfortable, I suppose, if you had a, a, a essentially a designated tag team, one commissioner, one staff that does a first review. Um, it didn't sound like the intention was necessarily to, to only have a staff person make the initial review for significance. If somebody could answer that, then I'm gonna go back to my original thought that I was gonna share. Chris? So my understanding is that if the commission designates more than one person, whether or not those two people are one commission member and one staff member or two commission members, that constitutes a subcommittee. So the commission really needs to designate one person and then authorize that person to consult with a counterpart on the, in the other group. And if it's a commission member that's the designee, that person would be authorized to consult with a staff person and vice versa. So that's how it would work in operation because we, are trying to avoid um, the ne necessity of posting all these meetings and keeping um, minutes. Thank you. Can I can I continue with my? So, um, in terms of generally, um, I, I did chuckle that you know the age the age limit is now seventy five. So, you know, the closer to your own age that that antiquity comes, you know the you you don't like to think that that. 50 is, is antique and you certain, you know, so 75 is a little farther out there for, for many people. Um, so I, I guess I'm- Only for some of us. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for that, Pat. <laughs> so um, I'm comfortable with the 75 year age. Um, I also do like that the, that the commission or the designee can um, review for significance, but they can also, but, Someone else can can call it significant, and if it's um, if there's any contention about that, it can just be automatically named significant for purposes of the conversation, and that um, essentially any application could be considered for significance. Um, so I think I think it it maintains some control for the commission with that array of of options for designating significance at least to start the conversation i think i'm i think i understood that properly thank you so i i raised my hand because i wanted to say um it sounds like the commission and Jane, you can correct me on this, that the commission is comfortable with the language regarding the significance determination and the flexibility it gives and 
you know, anything that could happen with that one person, one person with consulting, two people in open meeting, the full commission. And so I, I guess my thoughts are whether or not I'm comfortable with it, if the body that is going to be direct, you know, going to be, com, you know, compliant with this, that is making that determination is tasked with that is comfortable with that language and the flexibility it gives um i'm going to trust that body that was one of the conversations we had about a month ago is where does that belong given the kp law opinion and if the commission itself says you know we're still comfortable with this knowing what happens if you designate more than two or if you can only designate one then i think i'm okay with that language and so jane is is that a correct interpretation interpretation that the historical commission is okay with this language regarding the significance determination Yes, I think so, Mandy. Uh, uh, yeah, and uh, thanks for the question. Um, we we actually think this is an improvement in the language because I think in the in our first pass at this, it was um, it was more limited in how how the review how the reviewer was designated, but this gives us the flexibility for. Um, having a differently composed commission, uh, you know, a differently composed commission might want to, you know, take back some more regular authority. Uh, so, you know, this gives some, some wiggle room. Um, and to, you know, as we've talked in this conversation about, um, you know, whether it's one staff person consulting with one commission member or one commission member consulting with one staff person uh, or, or some different uh, composition, whether it's returned to the, the commission as a whole. Um, it, you know, I think it's gonna be important for um, a, a citizen, a volunteer uh, committee or commission to have these, you know, what's, what's inside the bylaw and what's outside the bylaw. So, Thank you, Jane. Any other comments or questions from CRC members? Seeing none, I'm gonna make a motion. Um, and the motion is to recommend the town council adopt general bylaw preservation of historically significant buildings as presented in the document titled um, Amherst Historically Significant Buildings Bylaw 05 May 2022 Clean. Dot PDF. <laughs> Second, DeAngelis. Are there any comments or on that, uh, Jennifer? Yes, I'm. I agree that I have confidence in the commission that if they, this is what they recommended. You know, I'm going to vote to um, approve it. I was just, I guess, concerned because, like you said, you don't always know who's going to be in different positions. You know, staff and commission. So I just wanted, you know. But I think I've been convinced that the pr protocols and protections are there. That even as you know, staff and commissioners, you know, you don't know who's going to be in those positions, you know, a few years from now. But that um, that there are enough um, protections there for the historic, you know, buildings in, in Amherst. And I think it's a good move to increase the age to seventy-five years. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Anything else? Seeing none, we're going to move to a vote. Shalini. Yes. Uh, Pat. Aye. Mandy's an aye. Pam. Aye. And Jennifer. Aye. That is a unanimous endorsement. Um, so excellent. Thank you, Jane. Um, for coming to be able to answer those questions and for Ben and Chris and Rob on your work and getting it to us. I believe, Chris, even though it's not referred to the planning board, that the planning board is planning on reviewing this latest draft. Is that correct? Planning board will be reviewing this latest draft. Um, they have it in their packet for next week. Um, they're going to be voting on the rescission, but they will have an opportunity to review the latest draft. Okay, thank you. And and you'll let me know when they've finished with both sets and all um, so that we can let GOL and the council know. Thank you for that. We're going to move on. Um, the next thank item you. on the, oh, thank you, Jane. Yes, you yes. Can, you're done for the, for the afternoon. Thank you very much.
Um, the next item on the agenda is the residential rental bylaw. Before we move to that, I want to see who all is here. Um, Rob, were you, do you know whether John Thompson was hoping to make today's meeting or not? I believe he was going to come. He told me he was going to join the meeting. Okay, because I know we're running a little ahead of schedule from what I had said. So um, we'll move on to something else. Um, Cause I think I had planned for about 520 for the residential bylaw. So if we think John will show up, we'll hold off on that one until um, we get to that estimated time and we'll move on to other things that don't require extra people. Um, if that's okay with Rob and Chris um, and Ben, Ben, I don't know whether you need to stick around for anything else on this agenda or not. I don't know whether you're involved in this part or not. So um, Ben might be free to go. Um, does that sound like a plan for everyone to make sure that since we're running a little ahead of schedule that we wait to do that part until we can see whether John can make it? Yep. Okay. So that means we're going to move on to planning board appointment recommendations, interview questions. Um, I'm going to see if I can. And for Athena's knowledge, that update did work for me being able to pick one document. <laughs> So, Thanks for letting me know. Because <laughs> um, I was just able to do that. So on the screen is the interview questions that the Community Resources Committee used last year, last spring for the planting board, planning board interviews. Um, that generally CRC has used the prior year's questions as a basis for determining whether we want to change them or add them or delete them or, you know, all of that. Um, and so I thought I'd put it up um, and see what people thought about these questions and whether there were any thoughts on additional questions or not. Um, so, and then what I'll do is I'll edit this document as we go through in hopes of being able to potentially adopt a set of interview questions. Pam. I was gonna ask Shalini, uh, maybe in yourself, if you're, uh, if your recollection of last year's uh, review process was comfortable, if you felt that, the, that the, if you felt the questions um, elicited a good discussion. Shalini, would you like to start with that? No, <laughs> you go. <laughs> So, so, so what I will say, Pam, is um, this, this set of questions sort of evolved through um, three years of interviews with planning board and ZBA over a number of committees. And um, uh, the members of CRC, when we adopted these, um, felt that I, I think most of these were used um this 2021 set and some of them were used in 2020 and they felt that they gave um the committee some some valuable information regarding thought processes approaches to decision making and all in ways that were in some sense unexpected for some of the questions um you know when when we did these interviews last may i believe um, we had five or six totally different answers to say question number three about achieving the goals of the master plan. Um, and, and similarly with collaborating with a group, you know, we found, I think with many of these that, um, the candidates, the applicants took them and made their own out of each of them. The applicants do get these questions beforehand. Um, so some prepare their answers, others kind of wing it on the fly, um, others have absolute written, others have a little outline. Um, and, and I think at least I found that the variety of answers was helpful. Um, and so personally, I liked these questions. We actually used a basis of these for, I, I think we got rid of number three and added a different one for the ZBA questions. Um, in the fall because we liked them so much and the ZBA ones were very similar here, but you know, we've, we did like them and we thought they were useful. And when we had extra ZBA openings in the fall, we don't, I don't think we changed any of the questions because we liked them so much. So I hope that helps. <laughs> and Shalini, if you want to add anything, go for it. 
Um, I just have, from my recollection, I think the as manager was saying there was uh, the questions really allowed us to see different people's perspectives and and even amongst themselves. I think it was nice to see how we first thought it might be awkward for them to all be interviewed at the same time. But I think it's been really nice to see how people are responding to each other's responses. And so overall, I don't see any problem with these questions. I'm just trying to remember if we got a criteria from the chair of the planning board and if there was anything like what they are looking for and if there was any other new or change information from them, what they would like to see in the planning board and if that needs to be reflected in the questions. So we did receive that input for the selection yeah. guidance. Um, my, you know, that that input is in the prior packet that we passed. Um, right. My re re recollection of that is the basic sort of selection criteria that we've heard before some experience in a, a variety of areas. Here's, you know, um, and of something related to sort of planning and zoning. Um, and then good collaboration, you know, willing to commit to meetings, hearings, site visits and stuff like that. So I think it was sort of typical of prior um, input we've received from chairs in the past. Jennifer. Oh, you're muted. I'm muted, right, sorry. I think these are excellent questions, um, but I'm wondering just, so, so if there was at, for possible additional questions, so I've been told by a couple of people on different boards and committees that there were actually new members that would join who sometimes had never actually attended that body's meetings before. So I'm wondering if, you know, we might ask if, you know, they, you know, have been tuning into planning board meetings or I think that would be helpful. Um, and the other question, although I know who's not going to give um, a magnanimous response, but maybe I, I am a little interested in, you know, what they think about public comment, but I, I wouldn't, those would just be my two possible additional questions. Thank you. Um, to answer the first one, question number one, the question talks about what they bring but then there's a little statement afterward, um, which was in some sense last year's CRC's um, compromise between asking a separate question about the experience you have serving and watching versus you know, trying to combine something into two. And so this one actually specifically says serving um, or watching one of their meetings, we could add attending at the time they'd been on Zoom for a while and they still have. So, so I think to your question number one, we've attempted to include it in um, question number one in, and hopefully the statement of interest that says that you're supposed to indicate why you wanna serve and include experience um, will elicit that. And if they do not mention it during an, an interview, that is also then in some sense telling, right? Um, yeah, so maybe we should just be, um cognizant that this has happened. It seems, you know, you wouldn't expect that, but that that I've heard that on more than one occasion. Yep. Any other thoughts? Oh, and you had a second question, which was, um, you know, what maybe you think of the role of public comment or, because I have to tell you, I have found it problematic on this board to be quite honest. I, I've been attending the meetings for the last couple of years and um, I have been surprised at sometimes they're, um, you know, I, I'll just say it. I've heard one member said, say that she hopes the board is not gonna be swayed by public comment and that's concerning. So I don't think anyone's gonna say they would disregard public comment, but you know, if it was possible to ask a question, because I think particularly on a planning board to get a lot of members of the public turning in, tuning in, you know, and they'd like to feel that they're, even if they're not agreed with that, they're listened to and their comments are respected. Pam and then Shalini. Um, yeah, we actually have question number six, 
which is a little bit redundant with one. And maybe by the time we've asked five questions, it's like, oh yeah, I remember something else I really want to say. That's kind of the, the, the reason perhaps for number six. But Jennifer brings up a really good point. Um, the, the planning board is a you know, quasi-legal entity. It, it, it brings bylaws to, to bear. It, you know, it creates bylaws. And they, these bylaws have to improve the town. So when you have when you have 40 people weighing in on something that appears to not benefit the town, it is, um, it's important to listen to those concerns and to, um, to take them at least into consideration and discuss why they might be appropriate. So I, I, would, I would agree with Jennifer that maybe we just think about uh, eliminating that number six and just say, uh, you know what is what is your uh, what has been your approach to either participating or contributing public input or being on the receiving end of public input that helps you be um, you know a better planning board member. Thanks. I, I haven't drafted that as a motion, obviously, but that that would be something that would go through my head. I'm I'm writing down how you worded it, and at least in my notes, and I will um, get it into this. It looks like I've got two more comments before I add it in. So um, Shalini and then Pat. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point about including a question around public comment. Um, I may not see um, see this in the same way as other members are seeing it. I think I see value in how people uh, listen to public comment and how they make sense of it, given the larger context of a community and an understanding of how our community works. And when we hear from even maybe 50 people, that's a lot. And I think that needs to be heard and acknowledged and integrated into a decision making process, while also acknowledging that we still have 28,000 other or 40,000 other residents or 30,000 other residents who haven't spoken on it, or there may be a specific community that's going to be impacted and they have no way of knowing that we're making this decision. So it's generally people of privilege. That's the experience and that's a flaw that we haven't yet fixed in our community engagement. I promise you I'm working on it, but we haven't yet fixed it. How do we get more? So I definitely appreciate the people who do make the time to come and speak. And at the same time, we, we can't be under the illusion that that's speaking for the whole community. And I'm not saying that that's what was intended here, but I just want to clarify that. Um, so I think it's a very nuanced thing. And I think it's a very good question, just the fact that we are discussing it in all these different ways. So I would like to see it included. Thank you. Pat. Thank you. Uh, I, respectfully, I need to disagree. I don't think it's uh, a strong question because it has a very specific answer that everyone will give. Um, the other piece for me is Public comment, I believe, is critically important. Um, but it, if, I, if I make public comment and a board or a committee or the council makes a decision that's different than my, what I want, doesn't mean I haven't been listened to. And so I, I really feel like uh, this question feels like it would just waste committee time. And what I know from my experience on other committees is this is very time consuming in a positive way, but I, I, don't, I, I don't see value to the question. Um, before I go to Jennifer, I forgot to raise my own hand. So I'm gonna say in some sense, I agree with Pat, but what I agree with, what, what I would say is I would disagree with getting rid of question six um, because what Pam actually said about the reason for it is exactly the reason 
people forget stuff all the time. And so, you know, we get to that question and some people are like, no, I think I said everything I want. And other people are like, you know, I forgot something. And so this is sort of that one last chance to say, did you remember something? Did you forget something? And so I would, I would not want to eliminate that chance from the interview. Right. Um, so I, I would, I, I would oppose removing question six, even though it appears very redundant. Um, Jennifer. Yeah, I mean, part of my question, I mean, the idea that people that go to meetings and make public comment are in a position of privilege is really the problem. I mean, people, if, if an issue affects the community, no matter whether it's zoning or community safety, the people that are affected by the agenda items on a committee will usually come to the committee and that doesn't mean they're privileged. So when people, I, I mean, I, I so I, take offense at that. And I feel like when particular often, because I go to the planning board, so that's when I'll speak to, I don't go to regularly every board and commission, but to have your public comment dismissed because you're perceived as being privileged or elitist, you know, frankly, when you live on a tiny house on a tiny lot, as many, you know, whatever, I mean, it's just, it's, it's kind of, it's a very mischaracterization. And I think because there's that position often people making comments before this board um, are dismissed. And I know the question to ask an, a candidate, you know, what do you think about public comment? I know who's gonna say they don't respect public comment, but I think that, you know, what I was getting at, frankly, was just illustrative. Pam? Thinking about the wording, I, thanks for, for showing it on the screen here. Um, if we if we said something like, you know, what's been your experience in offering public comment or being on the receiving end of public comment and, and how do you, you know, how do you incorporate that into your decision making? That's that's something very different than, you know, do you approve of public comment or not? I mean, we don't want to be so, so um, you know, cut and dry where you know what the right answer is going to be. I I'm really, I'm really interested in especially you know with what Shalini just said if there are folks who have have not felt listened to for instance um as as a minority person or something like that it's you know they they understand what it feels like to be on the giving end but but and not being heard um so i it just feels to me like it it might be actually a very a very valuable conversation similar to how that you know, opinion of waivers, exemptions, and dimensional requirements. I mean, that's a pretty nuanced and, and very detailed, very much pro, or I mean, um, in the weeds kind of a question. So um, how, how do you all feel about, you know, what's been your experience in offering comment and, and receiving comment? Thank you. Um, Shalini? Yeah, I just want to clarify that um, my statement that people of privilege are the ones who mostly are able to attend does not mean we don't listen to them because they're people of privilege. I'm just saying that that is one, uh, a subset of our community that's coming and we should not make the assumption that that is the larger community. And, and, and you're absolutely right. We should not disregard what they have to say just because they have privilege. And my statement was just to say that uh, when we have 50, I have made that mistake or error, assuming that when there are 50 or even 100 people coming, I think what it conveys to me, I mean, I'm acting like I'm the participant of and on the, you know, being asked that question. So what it means to me is that I think this is a very important issue because 100 people have shown up and I'm hearing how it's impacting them. And that is a very important thing to hear. So just because I'm saying that people are privileged, I am a person of privilege too. And at the same time, I'm a minority. So anyway, we are all in different places. But my point is that we have to hear how it's impacting people, no matter whether they're privileged or not. The reason I use the word privilege is only to make the statement that even if there are 100 people, it does not mean that that's reflective of the entire town. So as long as we're not making that assumption that this is the town has spoken or and we're clear about that, that's all I was trying to say. 
And that being said, I think this is really becoming a very interesting discussion. And even though I'm hearing what Pat said, that we may not get the answers that we want to get to really reflect, but then I'm also hearing what Pat said. And, and I think it may be a question worth putting in to see the diversity it brings from the perspective of people who've been at the receiving end and not have, have not felt heard or you know, what are people's different experiences around this question? So I think it's a worth, valid question. Thank you, Shalini. Jennifer. I still have to say the, the idea that the, the, even the word privilege would come into the conversation of people making public comment. I mean, everybody makes public comment. I, that, that um, yeah, I guess, you know, how do you define privilege? But if, if somebody, I mean, were the people privileged who were, you know, came to talk about the solar bylaw moratorium on one side or the other? I mean, I, I just, I have to tell you, that's why people feel people who are in no way privileged, <laughs> however we define that, feel that they are being dismissed just because they may have a different perspective. So I don't even know how that word even how that even applies to making public comment before a body like the planning board. People make people come to meetings all the time and they're not privileged by pr virtue of the fact that they come that they tune in to a public meeting. You know, particularly now that you know people can tune in from home, you don't have to, you know, retain a babysitter to go to a meeting. I mean, I just think that the, any assumption that people who come to meetings and make public comment are privileged and their comments should be looked at in that light um, is very uh, troublesome to me. Pat. Yeah, I'm not completely sure how to respond to you, Jennifer, uh, but you are privileged. I'm privileged. Everybody who is at this meeting is privileged. We live in a white supremacist society and it affects every action that we take as a citizen. Uh, it, and it doesn't mean that you're um, doing something wrong because I'm you're talking offering... about myself. No, let, let Pat speak. <laughs> it is, does not mean that one is doing something wrong because they're able to make public comment. But to dismiss the idea of privilege as something that needs to be looked at is is I'm trying to find a word that is not dramatic, but it, it's very much white fragility that you're responding with. And I know you don't want to hear that. And it, and I would love because I I would love to sit with you and have this conversation in a way that where we can really talk to one another. Um, but to dismiss privilege as yeah i've done i've made some dumb remarks around privilege because i get angry um, when it's not seen but you're making i believe assumptions that be, you're not listened to because you're assumed to have privilege um, I own my own home. You own your own home. We're privileged. I, I, yeah, I, you know, I'd love to have a conversation with you. So I'm going to let Jennifer respond, but then I want to move to the point of whether to ask the question or not. And this might be require a vote on whether to include it on this list or not, but I will let Jennifer respond and then we'll talk about the question. Yeah, I'm not talking about myself. I mean, yes, I am privileged. I felt I wasn't being listened to, so I ran for counsel. But I'm not talking about myself. There are many people in, from the diversity that's Amherst that come to meetings and offer public comment. And the assumption that they're privileged, I don't understand because many, many people are not. I'm not talking about myself. I can, you know. I understand that. But, so I just don't even understand how that word applies to public comment and I it seems to be assuming that the people that make public comment 
are just from one, you know, sector or whatever of Amherst, many people come and make public comment at all kinds of public bodies. Um, and I don't, so my concern is that people, you know, whether they're privileged or not privileged, I mean, that they're dismissed as being privileged when you certainly, you know, you don't even know personally the people that may be offering, that are there and offering public comment. So to me, I, I just don't, I, it seems like a non sequitur. I'm not saying you that a board has to make its decision based on the comments that were made, but they shouldn't be dismissed or the, the, the people should feel heard. And they certainly, you know, I know people that feel like they have been dismissed as being privileged when they're, you know, truly wouldn't, when they're not. So I, I don't think the word applies to making public comment at meetings. So we have some language on the screen for a potential for adding a question regarding public input or public comment. Um, I haven't heard any recent suggestions to change that language. So we're going to, um, oh, Pam, yeah, <laughs> you might did, have some suggestions. I did have a suggestion and that was what has been, if any, your experience in either receiving, in offering or receiving public comment and how does that, uh, how might that um, affect your approach to incorporating public comment into decision making? You're good, Mandy Jo. You are much faster than I am at this. How might that, how might that um, affect your approach? And that could be good positive, it could be negative, it could, it could reveal, you know, a lot about how they think about the public comment process even. How might, I, how might that be reflected? Yeah. I was going to support uh, the sentence as it was written, and I can't accept it as it's written now. So I think the simpler version is fine. It's you're not leading anybody there. You don't know where they're going to go. You're just going to listen. So. And I think people weave their experiences and differences into uh, their responses. So I think it's too much. I mean, some people may not have ever been on the receiving end of public comments, so they may not have actually incorporated it into their thinking. I don't know. Well, then they haven't been affected by their experiences that they've never dealt with public comment. I, I mean, I think the simpler question will give more of a range of answers than the way it's gotten rewritten. The, the, your last I, rewriting, I think, was I can, better. I can live with that. I think that was the last one. Um, Chris has a hand up. Yes. Chris, is this related to the interview questions? It is, but you've changed okay. it to, um, to go along with what I was going to say. I was going to say change the word to is instead of has been. Thank you. And Pam, you have given what Pat just said, you have no other. Um, I, I said I could live with it, okay. you know? So, so the question I have is, does this addition of this question need to go to a vote of this committee um, or has, has the committee reached consensus in adding it into the document? I'm good with it. <laughs> I've seen nods from Shalini. Pam said she could go along with it. Pat's got her hand up. And so we will add this in. Um, we do need to vote on the final list. Um, it includes um, a response of three minutes um, to everything but the last one that's basically a yes or no question. And we want to indicate that it is a yes or no question. We don't want people to expound on their time. Um, and so that would be if we have six people apply, um, 
a maximum of 21 minutes per each person if they use all three minutes we are looking at two hours of interviews. Is that a comfortable limit for people or would we like to change the number of minutes before we vote on this document? Pam? I was actually going to respond to the, uh, the comment below. If you just said up to, you know, up to two minutes probably would be fine. I think most people can get their thoughts across in two minutes. I, I, I sort of bristled at that you have, you will have 15 seconds to answer question eight or whatever. You know, it's just like a yes or no answer is is expected for for number eight. <laughs> I don't like, you know, I don't like rules that are too tight, you know? They bug that one better. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so is the committee okay with two minutes then? That, that saves seven times seven, about 40 minutes of time. <laughs> Pat, you look like you wanna say something, but you're muted. Yeah, I guess, I, I, I guess I'd like us to be uh, flexible because while I don't wanna hear three minutes of the same stuff over and over again, I think that two minutes can be too short. And I so when we're taught, I think that we have to have flexibility. So I would say two to three minutes to give a feel for that and then be pretty clear that you they've reached their limit. Um, so we could say two to three minutes and then um, what I can do before we get to the interviews is sort of plan which ones might get about what one depending on where we are in timing. Um, you know, start with three maybe, and then see if we're, see if people use the three or not um, and, and where we're going. Uh, Shalini. Yeah, thank you, Pat, for bringing that up because um, I did remember myself making that statement and I've struggled with it. And I know people sometimes because of diversity of whether it's uh, how we think or translation, second language, some people may need a little more time to articulate, even though I think we're getting the questions ahead of time. So that does help a lot overcome that challenge. But still, I think just I like uh, the suggestion Pat has of two to three minutes. But and just all of us being a little cognizant of that, that different people may have different speaking styles and they're yeah. So, OK, so I'm going to make the motion to adopt the interview questions for the June 2nd, 2022 planning board interviews as amended at today's meeting. Is there a second? Second, Rooney. Um, we're going to move to a vote. We start with Pat. Aye. Mandy's an aye. Pam. Aye. Jennifer. Aye. And Shalini. Yes. They are adopted unanimously. Um, thank you for that. And John we have Michelle. And do we have John too? We do, excellent. So sorry to keep you guys waiting. We were waiting for you. And so we were trying to get something else done. Um, so we are now going to go back to um, the residential rental bylaw draft language. Um, so I'm gonna put that on the screen. Um, actually, yeah, I'll, I'll put it on the screen unless people want to comment and all before we put it on the screen. I think on the screen is probably easier um, so that people can see what we're referring to. Um, and this is, um, I, I wanna thank Pam. Um, I know I was the one that took on this drafting and then I realized I didn't have as much time as I thought last week. So I emailed Pam and said, hey, do you wanna do a first draft? Um, and so she, she kindly did that for me, um, got it to me. I made some changes and this is the result um, of that. And so um, again, we're going to be adding to this document as we go through. This is sort of what was based, this is the creation based on our last discussion two weeks ago on, um, on particularly permit requirements and any exemptions. And it focused more on exemptions than the permit requirements. And then there are some notes later on about inspections, because we thought about some changes related to inspections and all and other things so that we don't lose them. And then Pam included nicely sort of a summary of the discussion at the end of the document so that we can sort of keep track of things. And so in that, we also started the definition section 
for anything that was defined, I've tried to put it into the definition so that that was sort of integral in some sense from what I heard from Rob and John about what is a dwelling unit, what is a rooming unit. Um, and so we need those definitions in order to deal with the rest of the bylaw. So those are in there too. Um, but before I go to you, Shalini, I wondered if Rob or John had any comments on this first um, before we open it up to sort of full discussion as to thoughts on all of it. Um, Rob or John? Rob. Um, one thing I noticed in the proposed bylaw, it doesn't carry over the term local agent that we use in our current bylaw. It does use a uh, person in charge. Uh, so I just, you know, I just wanted to mention, you know, maybe when we get into inspections or further along into the bylaw that we would want to define one or both of those, um, you know, one of the things that we would have liked, what we'd like to see uh, after using the current bylaw for so many years is that as an enforcement tool or a remedy to a uh, situation, being able to have a professionally managed property be, uh, you know, required for properties that are not performing well. And whether that's local agent or some other term, just bringing that definition into the bylaw somehow. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of place that in there for maybe continued discussion. So I'm going to try and keep notes along the side here so that we don't lose them from this draft. Um, John, do you have anything at this point that you'd like to start with before we go into full discussion? I don't think so. Let me um, just um, confirm that we're talking about sections C and D this time. So B, C, and D in general, yeah. Okay, um, right. You know, the definitions that are in B apply to C and D. Yes, I've got some thoughts about um, exemptions in, in section D, so I'll wait till we get there. Um, Shalini. Yeah, concerning definitions, I was looking at Salem, Lynn, and Boston bylaws, and they all include a definition for a chronic offender and problem property. We may choose different words, but they all three have the same names. Uh, uh, the, the definition for problem property and and the uh, chronic offender. So I don't know if that's something we want to include in our definitions. So what I will say is this definition section is not complete. It is solely the ones that were used in section C and D. And so mm -hmm. as, as Rob mentioned, when we get into inspections or when we get into length of licenses and mm -hmm. things like that, we'll be adding in definitions. And I think that's where that will come in. But again, I'm making the note here to right. make sure that's part of those conversations as we get there. Right, thank you. So let's start with, instead of the definitions, let's start with section C and then section D. Um, and we can probably discuss C and D together because they kind of relate to each other, right? Um, D says, here's the places people or properties that don't need to get a permit at all. Um, and C says what, a per what this bylaw essentially applies to, which is the dwelling units and rooming units and, and all, which is where the definitions come in. Um, so uh, John, do you wanna start with your thoughts on exemptions? Sure, thank you. Um, two things that I've got highlighted here. Um, item C under um, section D, dwellings owned and operated by the Amherst Housing Authority. We currently permit those properties. Um, so that would be um, something new, we'd be excluding them. And the second one is um, under um, item E, dormitories, sorority houses and fraternity houses. We don't um, permit dormitories, but certainly do sorority houses and fraternity houses. People pay rent to live there, their rental units. Okay, and so I think John, 
you're looking probably at the working draft um, yep. on the screen is the most recent and I think we've exempted dormitories, but if I did the definition right, we have not exempted sorority or fraternity houses from that Rob. I, I think unless sorority and fraternity houses are permitted under section 3.326, which I do not believe they are of the zoning bylaw. Is that correct? I think he's looking something up. Mandy, I, I think your the revised version captures both changes that John recommended right. that we talked about last week. I think maybe he uh, he had to leave the meeting early when right. we, we yeah. discussed both of these things. So I think I, I think we have it covered now in the new version. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that that the sororities and fraternities, I think they're defined differently than dormitories in the zoning bylaw. And since we've used the zoning bylaw definition, if they're not, then we need to rethink that. But I think they are. So okay. Um, Pam. I was going to go back to a definition, but I think I'll, I'll hold on it. And just for Rob's benefit, I was, I really, I'm trying to get my mind around the rooming unit definition, but let's come back to that after we have a better conversation about the rest of it. Yeah, I, Jennifer. No, I was just going to ask, um, I think with some of the other housing developments, if the town, I, I do think it's good for them to be permitted, as John said, but I think maybe it, I don't, I don't know if it's got confusing that, but they're not, they're not inspected by the town. Is that correct? So I think that's the section we haven't totally got to where we noted down here in inspections that for future discussion, which of the ones like um, Amherst Housing Authority should we exempt from inspections, even though we want them to receive the permit. And so that will be a further discussion when we get to inspections, I believe. But Rob? Uh, I was actually going to go back to the last point. Um, yep. So looking at the definition of dormitory and referencing the zoning bylaw section, that section of the bylaw is a use classification, not a definition. It's a use classification that includes fraternity, sorority, social dormitory, and similar use. And these are these are all uses that are, um, you know, according to your exemption, uh, located in an educational district and operated by the educational institution. So that that would not exempt sororities and fraternities that are, um, you know, in the RG district where our eleven, uh, you know, buildings exist currently. Okay, so and if it wasn't low, if we didn't have that note down here in the wording that we think you were using um, located in the ED, that's important in order to ensure that sororities and fraternities in the uh, in the RG are not exempted, right? And dormitories that are privately owned, we don't okay. want to exempt those either. Uh, so I think, I think because you connect to the definition, if there happen to someday be uh, sorority fraternities that are owned, operated by the university and on, in the ED district, those would then be, I think we would say those would be exempt by this language. Uh, so let me ask a, a question as I think through what UMass is doing now, now that you said that, which is, I think Pam was thinking the same thing. They are in a public private partnership to build dorms that will be in the ED district, but will, my understanding is, be operated by a private entity. Um, is that something, Rob, you would want to be captured as requiring a permit, or would you be okay with those, that particular one being exempted from a permit? So, you know, that particular situation is not resolved because um, you know, there's a possibility that it should fall under our jurisdiction being privately owned buildings. Uh, so we're trying to work out, uh, Dave Zomek and others are trying to work out that, that question with the university. Uh, so I think um, we'd want to be consistent. You know, if we, 
if we're doing annual inspections of those buildings, be, you know, due to building code and other, uh, you know, codes and regulations we enforce, we'd also want to do that for uh, rental regulations. But likewise, if we didn't, we would probably exempt them. So I think that's just not resolved yet. Okay. So that's something that in the next couple of months we'll have to revisit maybe. Pam. I was gonna ask Rob if, um, if he could actually clarify the definition of dormitory because I didn't realize that, I mean, <laughs> and, and Chris Brestrup is probably in this, you know, thinking the same way is that we have, we have mixed use buildings that are essentially dormitories, but have a, a, a commercial component. We have apartments that are primarily filled with students and they serve as a dormitory, but they're off campus and they're privately owned. I didn't realize that that Rob had a definition of a privately owned dormitory. And I'm curious if he could give an example of maybe what one of those privately owned dormitories is. So just to clarify, we actually don't have a definition of the term dormitory, what we have is a use classification in the zoning bylaw that describes it as a dormitory and other similar uses that are in some way connected to the university or college. And that the purpose of that use classification is to determine where a building with that use could be located. The one example that we have of that right now is Olympia Place. Uh, owned by Archipelago on Olympia Drive. And uh, I believe they're beginning the process to permit another similar building, uh, privately owned uh, dormitory uh, next door to that where the sorority used to, uh, where the sorority used to be. Okay. I'm sorry, I wanna go to Pam's question because this is one um, that I think both Pam and I were cognizant of as this was getting drafted, the comment Rob had about rooming unit and how the current bylaw exempted rooming, essentially the exempted from required permitting someone renting out a room in their home, but did not exempt um, some sort of rooming lodging. Cause I think we still have one like rooming house um, and Oh, well, exempted the current bylaw exempted someone renting out a room in their home, but the draft working draft that that John has referenced today actually included the rental of a room in someone's single family building as requiring a permit and Rob you recommended that not be the case and so I tried to make the definitions and and the terms I, I, I went back to the current bylaw to add the rooming unit in this permit required rooming unit in a lodging or boarding house being operated as a principal zoning use. And then we, I, I'm not sure either Pam or I, I, I struggle with the definition of rooming unit here. Um, did it, did those two together capture Rob what you want the permit to be required to obtain, but not what we were trying to exempt, which is Rent, the renting of one bedroom in a single family home by someone who is living in that home. I think that's probably Pam's question too, but she can add to it if I didn't capture it all. Rob? Yeah, uh, so the definition looks good and in the uh, permit requirement you've added being operated as a principal zoning use, which is exactly what we have in the current regulations. So by doing that, those that are not operated as principal zoning uses, therefore accessory uses, like the renting of the rooms in your home would not be subject to the permit. So I think it, I think it ends up with the same language that we have today. Okay. So that, that accomplished what we were trying to do based on your recommendations two weeks ago, I believe then. It does. Okay. Pam, do you have any other questions regarding rooming units? No, I'm just still trying to work my way through the, through the, uh, the logic of it. So renting one room in a primary use home does not require a permit. 
Yeah, and so our zoning bylaw authorizes the, the letting of rooms to three individuals by right. Okay, so up to three then, yeah. Up to three, so that's that's permitted by right, doesn't require a special permit. Uh, so, you know, we don't wanna create a conflict with that. Right, right, so that's good. So when it comes up, Sorry, becomes, go Pam. Sorry. Uh, when it becomes a, a, a rooming house, do we actually have a clear definition of a rooming house? I mean, there used to be rooming houses in Amherst to, to house college students. I mean, that was sort of a, an industry. There's only one now and it's um, it still exists because it's a grandfathered non-conforming use. Which one is that? It's on South Prospect Street. Oh, okay. would, would this language of rooming unit in a lodging or boarding house being operated as a principal zoning use capture that one non-conforming use rooming house? I believe it does, yes. And I believe just having the definition of rooming unit, um, you know, the rooming unit is what would be, what would make up either the boarding house or the lodging house by definition. So I, I, I'm not sure we need a definition of rooming house, lodging house, boarding house, the rooming unit seems to capture it. You know, rooming unit, dwelling unit are the, the, the two different uh, definitions that we need. Jennifer. Yeah, I just um, wanted to ask if there was a concern. So you can have up to, you know, three people living and renting a room in your house and you're the owner also living in the house. So that, that's fine. But just in terms of, um, I mean, I'm not even saying one you would need a permit, but how do you ensure for the sake of the people renting that the dwelling is safe and up to code? Or is it just, you know, like we should all be keeping our homes safe and up to code, but it seems like if you're renting, you should have a special protection. Rob? Right, so I, yeah, I think we'll agree with you when we get to that section. So right now, the, the protections are that we're available for anybody renting a, a, a unit to call us. And, you know, and I think that's, you know, something we, we would, you know, we, we, we respond to every complaint or every request. That's something that John does regularly. Uh, but when we move into the discussions about inspections, you'll probably hear us supporting the idea of getting a look occasionally at these units to, to do exactly what you just mentioned. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll note that down in inspections. So I have another question, which, which I put in here. Our definition of residential rental property as proposed in this draft says the definition does not include mobile homes, hotels, motels, bed and breakfast establishes, establishments operated as principal uses. And then we go down to exemptions and we say lodging facilities, hotels, motels, inns, hostels, and bed and breakfasts. And so I guess my question is, do we need that in both places? Um, and if we don't, where is it better located? Should we not put that sentence in the definitions and then just use it as an exemption? Or should we have, is that more clear than if we left it in the definition and got rid of the exemption? Or are they not, um, are those two actually not equal to each other? Rob. Yeah, I would suggest uh, leaving it in the definition, I'm sorry, in the exemptions and removing it from the definition. Uh, if you want to, you know, if you want to take it away from one of the, the locations, I think people will look and find the exemptions easier than they would by reading the last, uh, you know, the last part of a, a definition. Okay. Thank you. Any, I think that, let's see. Um, were there other questions with the clarity issue there? Oh, and Pam, you asked about the calling out a rooming unit in a lodging or boarding house, but I think we addressed that question just recently. Um, and then there was a question here about the notwithstanding 
comply with inspections below. And so that goes to, I think, Rob, one of the things you just said about inspections. Um, can this bylaw um, capture more uh, inspecting more units than a permit is than units that are required to obtain a permit. Um, and so it, it goes to this halfway houses and group homes thing. If we don't require them to obtain a permit, do they can we still say you need an inspection? Um, and and that goes to the Rob, what you were saying about um, some other things about rooming units in single family homes. If we don't require them to have a permit, can we still require a regular inspection under this bylaw? I would suggest we don't want to do that. Um, you know, the, the, the rooming houses, the motels, the hotels, you know, those other types of uses other than the single family homes fall into a different inspection program, periodic inspection program that the building inspectors manage. Uh, so periodically the ho a hotel would get inspected anyway. Uh, so I don't think it needs to. The question would come down to the properties that wouldn't be subject to any other inspection program that we operate. And that's a single family home uh, that, or two fit single or two family home that is owner occupied and rooms are being rented uh, as an accessory use. My opinion is we don't, we don't want to inspect those properties. We don't want to expand the program to that point. Uh, everything three units or larger uh, already gets an inspection by John uh, every two years. Uh, that's just looking at the common spaces, though, hallways, stairways, um, uh, fire escapes, uh, making sure fire alarm sprinklers are operating. This bylaw, if, if it's a, rent, a permit, uh, a property with a permit, would allow the inspection of the dwelling unit as well. Uh, so I think that would be the, the logical next step, uh, but not trying to capture some of those other properties. So does that mean we should be deleting this notwithstanding shall comply with inspections below, Rob? Since they're exempt from obtaining a permit? While he thinks on that, oh, if you're ready. <laughs> yeah, no, I think so. I don't want to create confusion, you know, those those um, those group homes are going to be inspected. Uh, they're also managed by the, in most cases, managed by the state, uh, either Department of Mental Health or some other organization that's doing inspections. So uh, I don't think we need to make um, make those part of the inspection program. Uh, Pam, you're muted. I was gonna make sure I understood what Rob said. <clears throat> so um, I didn't realize that three units or larger gets inspected every two years anyway. So I think what we're, I, I'm, I'm falling between the cracks when I'm talking about who gets a permit and then the exemptions. So um, something with three units or larger does get a permit and it gets inspection. Do we, do we include those in our exemption list? So I think Rob said they get inspected every two years, only the common areas, not the units themselves. Yeah, so if we're looking to look at units, we need to call that out because all I'm doing is walking through the hallways um, you know, I'm not going in any units. And, and John, would you like the ability to go in units for those places that have three or more units for health and safety reasons? Like, uh, is, is it, do you think we should include those in this bylaw permitting bylaw? I think it's, it's, um, it's a complicated answer. Um, I, I have a full-time job right now and um, I'm not going in 
you know, 5,000 rental units in, in the town of Amherst. Um, and I'm not gonna be able to, so. Yep. Uh, Rob and then Pam and then Shalini. So I appreciate John's response, but you know, I don't think we need to be concerned about that at this point um, on how we're going to, you know, manage the workload will, will be a discussion that we'll have later on once we decide what we want the bylaw to be. Uh, I think, in fact, we do want the ability to inspect the dwelling units or in larger properties, at least a certain percentage of the dwelling units to represent their condition. So I think as we, you know, move on in inspections, we are looking to capture that. And I think this, the way, you know, the form of this bylaw is doing uh, so. Thank you. Um, Shalini, you unraised your hand? Yeah, I think Rob answered, uh, said what I was gonna say. Okay, and Pam, you also unraised your hand, so you're good. Are there any other thoughts, questions, requested changes? Um, obviously this is not set in stone, right? This is a working document, this is just, these definitions, these these drafts based on a first conversation that any further conversation might actually affect some of these sections too. Um, but but before we end this discussion today, are there any thoughts or requests for changes um, regarding whatever's written here in this particular document? And I can scroll to wherever anyone wants. I'm not seeing any. Um, Rob, at this point, you and John are fairly comfortable with what's been written here based on your desires regarding rental permitting. Yes, for permit required and, ex and exemptions, I am. Um, I think, you know, as mentioned, we'll be continuing to come back to definitions as we develop the rest of the bylaw. Yep. Okay. Pam. Yeah, that sums up what I was hoping to hear that as we move forward, we can at least uh, keep referring back to uh, the expectations of the, of the town staff of what, what they have seen are the issues and, and does this tool give them the, or does this document give them the tools they need to do the right thing? So if, you know, when we get out of line with that, I'm hoping to hear from Rob and John Excellent. I think that means, you know, I, I will clean this document up, um, make some of those changes I was doing for our next draft. The next draft won't probably be seen um, until um, the next time on our work schedule, we are looking at draft language, um, which on the current plan, if all goes well, and I'm not sure it will, on the current plan is draft language June 9th. Um, we'll see how we go with our discussion on May 26th. Um, but you know, it's sort of discussion, then draft, discussion, then draft is the way I set up the draft plan so that we could have an open discussion and then draft the language based on that discussion. Um, and so the next revision will come out on June 9th or whenever that next draft language comes out based on the next discussion. Um, any questions, concerns, or comments um, before we move on on our agenda from this? Pam? Yeah, just to, since you've got your document right there, can you remind us which section you were targeting next? Yes, so um, for May 26th, the goal is to discuss um, application process and requirements along with a sustainability lens. Um, and then, so, so that would be what do we put, what do we require uh, property owners to disclose and provide in an application? Um, what does that process look like? Um, and then, and, and, and that's where I put sustainability lens because I had heard that ECAC wanted to potentially add some uh, questions into an application in order to gain some data. Um, it might not, it's probably not going to be the only place that sustainability comes in, but that's where I put it initially. I am in contact with 
Um, Steve Roof of ECAC, who Laura Drocker, the chair, has told me to contact to figure out how ECAC can best um, contribute to those conversations. Um, and I have also been in contact with um, the Board of License Commissioners, and as I get their feedback, they, I believe, had a meeting on Tuesday. I'm not sure they got to this, um, but I'm in contact with the chair of the Board of License Commissioners to make sure that we get their feedback and all. They have the draft that was in the packet today, um, and I'll keep them up to date on the drafts as we go, too. Um, on June 9th, in addition to the application process and requirements and sustainability lens, which is section F of the working draft, and I haven't come up with which sections of the current bylaw that is yet, um, we would add in the fee authority, regulation authority, and transfer of license, so types of sections to the bylaw. Um, so, you know, those are sort of basic sections that probably don't need a lot of discussion before they get to a draft stage. So um, I will put another, the work plan is in the packet today, I believe. I think I put one in every week. So um, that's there. And I list the sections in the, in the, um, in the agenda that is in the, the referred draft in the current bylaw. Um, so that people can refer to both of those drafts to see what we're discussing. Any other questions, Pam? Yeah. Um, so uh, I would love to ask if Rob and John could also bring um, perhaps the somebody or the folks from from the IT department who actually managed the applications. Um, I think I had heard at some point that you know, whatever we develop has to be workable by them. What does their programming allow? And I think that would be very helpful to actually hear directly from them the kind of information that they they can manage. And and then what you know, if we if we start stretching things, is that possible? I would I would request that we get some feedback from them. Thanks. That is a great idea. I put that onto my list for things too. Um, so I will try and touch base with that. A any other thoughts? Uh, Shalini. Yeah, um, I've started to put together some sort of a community engagement plan, keeping this particular bylaw in mind. And I was wondering how to go about, like, should I talk to you about it? Because what I'm thinking is like, who all are affected like definitely residents uh neighborhoods uh the residents but then students and then the landlords or and then apartment building and then the tenants and so there are all these different people who are impacted and so at what point are we planning to get their feedback or just even let them know that we're discussing this so they can start sending us feedback or yeah so things like that Thank you for that question. Um, that reminds me, um, last week it was requested to have a sooner rather than later, um, where is it on this draft, um, a public form of some sort. Um, and looking at the work plan, um, that form would probably not be able to be held during a season we don't can people still hear me because everything just froze i can hear you you did um, break up for a little bit can you repeat so we don't okay yeah so, so thank you. oops you're breaking up um people wanted to know when we could have a public forum which probably mm -hmm. cannot be held during public during CRC meetings, just because of the time of everything. So in looking at the draft work plan, there are a couple of meetings where we could potentially do that. Um, we had put in a May 23rd, which is a Monday night um, catch up or extended public input meeting that would be in about a week and a half. Um, or there was one in July, um, July 11th, um, as a potential for one. Um, and July 25th was a potential Monday night one. There was not a potential Monday in June, um, but if the council, the council meets two, has three of the four Mondays in June held for council meetings, 
I don't know whether the last Monday in June, June 27th will actually be used for a council meeting. If it's not, that might be a possibility. Um, but it was held for a council meeting. So that's another possibility for when to have sort of an initial extended public input forum, Shalini, um, that we could discuss um, in more detail. I cannot attend a May 23rd meeting. Um, I don't know whether others can, but since there was nothing scheduled, I scheduled other stuff that night. <laughs> so um, it's also a very quick time frame to turn around to get the word out. So we might be aiming for maybe one of the Mondays in June that might not have a council meeting. Um, right now, those are the June, we have a council meeting on June 6 and June 13. June 20 is a holiday, which is why there is no council meeting. Um, it would probably not be a wise idea to hold a public forum that day. Um, and then June 27th is held for a council meeting. I don't know whether there is going to be one that night or not. But we could aim for June 27th if that is not turned into a council meeting. Shalini? Uh, I think I'd stated to you in a survey that Tuesdays are locked out, but they've opened up for me. So if at any point we need to do a schedule a meeting on Tuesday evening, I have opened up for that. Okay. So let me send out a survey regarding potential public forum nights in June. Pam. I was just gonna say if it seems like the 27th is a much better date than trying, I mean, I, I'm advocating to have a public forum sooner rather than later before we have things, you know, sort of appearing to be locked in. Um, Cause I really think it's important that people do get a chance to weigh in. But that said, it, it seems so preliminary now that um, the 27th seems like the earliest good, good opportunity. That said, I am not gonna be here on that day, but you can still go ahead without me. Um, other thoughts on that? Shalini. Also, can I reach out to you to go through the plan, the rest of it? Yes, um, let's schedule a meeting to, okay. to just talk, talk through some stuff. Okay, thank Shalini. you. Shalini. Thank you. Um, seeing no other comments on this agenda item, we're going to move to the ZBA appointment process. Um, Sufficiency of applicant pool, I left it on to, oh, before, John I always and, yeah, forget to thank Rob, Rob thank and John and all before you guys leave. So <laughs> thank you, Rob, thank you, John, and thank you, if Chris is still here, Chris, for coming and attending and offering your input. We look forward to hearing more of it as we move through this process for that, but thank you for taking the time out today to to review that with us and give, your, give us your input. Thanks and thank me. you, Michelle, too. I know you were quiet the whole time, but... Um, <laughs> So ZBA appointment recommendations. Um, I left this on the agenda, sufficiency of the applicant pool. Um, I did not put, and I didn't have Pam put any documents in the packet regarding ZBA. Um, as we all know, it still stands at the same number. Pam, your thoughts on that? It's still three, right? Uh, you're muted. Pam, you're muted. Sorry, um, I'm counting up for four or five people that, that also said that they were applying for both the, the uh, planning board and, and ZBA. And I am not trying to push the ZBA back, but there seems to be a larger pool of people that have a, an interest in both. And since we only have two positions available on the planning board, it may mean that there are some people who um, find themselves without a planning board appointment. And I would love to consider any and all of them as part of an applicant pool for the ZBA. Jennifer? I was actually gonna say the same thing as if, if we are, you know, if we have some really strong planning board candidates, but we don't have enough spots on the planning board, would it be appropriate to ask them if they would consider ZBA? So we have done that in the past. Um, 
unless they submit a CAF, they're technically not an applicant for the ZBA. And then unless they submit a separate statement of interest, once we move forward, they are not an applicant. We do have to start moving forward on a process if we want to start scheduling interviews and dealing with um, selection guidance, interview questions and all. We can't do the selection guidance until we've declared the pool sufficient. Um, we can't ask for statements of interest until we've de declared a pool sufficient. Um, so, you know, while we may not, feel we have a sufficient pool right now. Um, planning board interviews have been scheduled for June 2nd. We could go ahead and try and find a date for ZBA interviews that is a week or, well, that is more than a week later than that. And I say that because statements of interest have to be posted a week before interviews. And so at that posting, things close. And so if we only have it a week later, we can't get people who we have not recommended into a ZBA pool, but maybe what we should do in order to start moving this process forward is potentially declare the pool sufficient for the purposes of moving forward with revisiting that pool at a later time. Um, that would allow Pam to start sending the emails to for us to start finding interview dates, for us to start getting all that other process going. Um, even if we're concerned that it is not a large enough pool at this time. Thoughts on that? Pam. I, I would like to lean in that direction so that we have some target dates and I don't think it, I don't think we're preclu precluded from setting some tentative interview dates for ZBA, even if we haven't official, officialized the, the pool. Okay, Jennifer. Um, so if, if we move ahead, applications could still come in and be considered if they come in? Yeah. Yes, the applicant pool does not close. And I've turned off my video because my internet's just going kind of crazy right now. And I feel like I can hear better without the video. So I apologize to people trying to watch. But the applicant pool remains open until the statements of interest are posted on the website for the interviews. And so moving forward just says, hey, we think we have enough. We can always revisit it. And the applicant pool is not closed at all, depending on this decision that we make. Even if we say we're going to move forward on stuff, people can still apply. And frankly, we would encourage people to apply. Thank you. So given what I've heard, I guess I'm going to make a motion to declare the applicant pool for zoning board of appeals appointment recommendations sufficient to move forward in the process at this time. <laughs> Is there a second? Second, Sean. Further conversation? See none, I think we're up to Pam, right? On starting the vote? Oh, sure. Yes. Uh, Jennifer? Yes. Uh, Shalini? Yes. Pat? Aye. And Mandy is an aye. Um, so Pam, let's touch base on next steps. Yep. Okay. Um, with that, we are on to general public comment. Um, and so at this time, public comments on matters within the jurisdiction of the CRC will be accepted. Residents are welcome to express their views for one to three minutes, um, for up to three minutes. Um, 
at CRC will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during public comment. So if you would like to make public comment at this time, please use the raise hand button um, to raise your hand and I will recognize you in turn. Seeing no hands raised, we will close public comment and move on to minutes. Um, are there any requested changes to the April 28th, 2022 meeting minutes? Seeing none, I'll make the motion to adopt the April 28th, 2022 meeting minutes as presented. Is there a second? Second. Jennifer. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Any comments? Seeing none, we'll move to a vote. Jennifer? Yes. Shalini? Yes. Pat? Aye. Mandy is an aye. Pam? Aye. We are on to announcements. Um, I don't really have any announcements per se, other than what's also on the next couple agendas. So they kind of go hand in hand. The public hearing for flood maps and zoning overlay district, as well as any discussion related to the recommendation to adopt the um, firm maps and whatever all those referrals were, there was like four things we have to do, but only two of them require a public hearing, um, is on May 26th. That is our next meeting. The public hearings will be at 4.30 and 4.45. There are actually two separate public hearings, one for the zoning overlay district, the zoning changes, and one for the zoning map, the change to the zoning map. It is the way the planning department recommended we hold the hearings. So that's why there are two. They came to me with two hearings. That's how the planning board is doing it too. So those will start at 4.30. When the hearings are closed, we'll move into discussion and recommendation on all four of those items. Um, and then we will move on from there into as much time as we have for discussion of rental registration, those parts I talked about um, earlier today. That, that will be the agenda um, along with, I guess, some ZBA recommendation um, so the uh, selection guidance for ZBA will be on that agenda. Um, so June 2nd at 4.30 p.m. are the applicant interviews for the planning board. And then immediately following that, the agenda will include making a recommendation to the council for planning board appointments. If we can get to a recommendation that evening, um, which this meeting, given the number of questions, depending on how many applicants we have, may go past 6.30. Um, I will warn people if it does, I may not be able to do the whole meeting. I will figure something out with tr some transportation issues, um, but we're going to figure it out. But um, it may go past 630, depending on the length of the interviews. But if we can get those recommendations done, the council will be able to take them up on June 6th at its June 6th meeting. So they will not be sort of hanging out there in limbo for very long if we're able to make recommendations that day. Um, so that's, and that will be the only thing on that meeting because um, I expect it to take enough time that we wouldn't put anything. It will be a special meeting. Um, so yeah, those are the next two meetings. Um, and then we have one scheduled for June 9th, which is a regular meeting. Um, so we're gonna have a busy June um, because we still have to schedule ZBA interviews somewhere in that time frame too. Um, so any questions, thoughts on next agendas or agendas in general um, before I adjourn the meeting? Seeing none, I don't have any items unanticipated by myself. And so I'm going to adjourn the meeting at 6.20 PM. Thank you all so much and have a nice evening. Thank you. Bye-bye.